Today, we have another Young Indian with us, Voice of the Young series. Hello, everybody. Good to be with you once again. Today, we have with us Srikant Ghising. Over to you, Srikant. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Subodhi, so much for this opportunity. And uh, it's really inspiring that you created this platform for the voice of the young Indians, especially, to speak about their life and work. I'm grateful for this opportunity once again. And hello to everyone. Namaste. Uh, I am Srikan Gisil. I come from Siliguri, West Bengal. And uh, from the foothills of the Himalayas, the Darjeeling region. And currently, I am based in New Delhi. I, I am a public policy grad by the current training that I've undergone. Currently, I'm looking to work in this avenue of policy, environment, urbanization, and sustainable development. So, uh, so coming from the Darjeeling Himalayan region, I have always been close to the lap of nature since it is the region is one of the 32 biodiversity hotspots in the world, the richest biodiversity hotspots in the world. And growing up, uh, that 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 influenced me a lot. That all inspired me a lot, and therefore uh, I chose. Uh, and in uh, and that had a great influence on choosing public policy as a way to go forward. Right. So I chose to study public policy and to start my career in public policy to bring about sustainable development uh, in my areas of interests. And they are in the region of uh, sustainable development in the Himalayan region uh, uh, with economic growth connected with ecological uh, integrity too. And to keep this vision in mind, I found public policy to be a very impactful way of going about the change I bring to envision in this world. And therefore, here I am you know, my training in public policy. Uh, the internet glitch is over and Srikant is back. Over to you, Srikant, again. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. And so, like I was saying, I'm, I've just uh, undergone a course in public policy from the Indian School of Public Policy here in New Delhi. And I'm looking to start my career. Currently, I am interning with an organization which is into carbon finance, carbon markets called Sequest Capital. Uh, it has a operations uh, worldwide focusing on nature-based solutions, developing carbon projects. And my role is that of government affairs. And we also... Uh, I'm trying, we as a team are trying to uh, build a government affairs strategy from scratch in this organization, uh, focusing on the African region. Okay, Srikant, let me so, just stop you for a minute. Do you know who is the worldwide head of Sequest? Uh, the worldwide head, uh, if uh, you're talking about the CEO, he is, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I forget you. Is it Ken Newcomb? Yes, it's Newcomb. He was the he was the guy I went to interview in the World Bank in 1990. Right. He came to I went to his office. I waited there. He was late. He came and he said, uh, "I just want to see your face. One day I'll hire you." So Ken Newcomb, I know very well personally, because after that he was, you know, he did hire me. One day his associate called and said, Subodh, you're hired. I said, for what? He said, that's not relevant. You are hired. Come. So <clears throat> his uh, associate at that time went on to become the head of energy at the World Bank. And Ken himself was very senior in the World Bank before he started Sequest Capital. So I'm happy to see somebody who's now working for Ken. Ken is very dynamic and very, very innovative man. 
uh, he set up a very nice company. So sorry to interrupt, but I had to get it in. <laughs> All right, let's no, continue. No, that's that, that's a wonderful insight, Rupert. So, yeah. so uh, in the in the policy space, right in our in our college and in this uh, space, <clears throat> we say that the policy circle is so small that we run into each other almost every day, yes. and yeah. this is again yet proved yet another time. Right. Uh, so yeah, I was talking about my internship in Sequest, and it's been a, it's almost going to be a month now, and uh, so the work is pretty uh, a new experience for me, uh, being a fresh grad in public policy, and so we we're trying to chart out a strategy about how the C, the company Sequest can you know liaison and build relations with the government bring about visibility about the mm -hmm. social impact it is doing in the carbon space and carbon mitigation space right so and uh, yeah so the next thing i want to talk about is uh, the public policy space in india right now okay and uh, so so and 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 that was one of my reasons to choose a career here in public policy is that. But Srikant, uh, let me stop I you think, there. Let me stop you because yes. I have seen your profile. You are talking about public policy, but you start. You have done many different things. Why don't you go back and tell us how you started and how you got here? Before you talk about oh, this, right. place. yeah, just to know right. how people change as they go along. I just want to hear it from you rather than me saying it. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So, 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 yeah. I was, I, I think I was going backwards. I was starting currently and going back, but I think that's a good uh, place to start. So I'll start from the beginning, and uh, it would be so. I did my undergrad was a bachelor's in commerce from the yeah. Sri Satya Sai Institute of Higher Learning, and that was another. That was totally another level of amazing experience, amazing three years of my life. So uh, so aside, a little aside, I am very much interested to interested in spirituality, reading practical Vedanta and uh, you know the getting about to know about the purpose of life and the higher purpose of life. And the Sri Satya Sai Institute was actually provided me that spiritual atmosphere to and develop myself as an individual and I did my undergrad in BCom there and after that I, I graduated in the year 2020 and after that I was exploring the area of sustainable development and uh, uh, and, and allied areas and in the process I did a few internships my first internship was with TD uh, so the company is called T D T I double -E T I. It's based okay. in the it's based in the uh, Darjeeling. It's based near Darjeeling, and it's a permaculture forest garden founded by an, another amazing person called Utsav Pradhan, who's been a mentor and a guide to me in the area of environment conservation and sustainable development. I look up to him. And uh, so that had been an eye-opening experience for me and an eye-opening internship for three months where we studied about the, you know, the menace single-use plastic has created and, uh, and, and, such, and such pollutions that's been uh, increasing and affecting the fragile ecosystem of the Himalayan region at devastating levels. So... But not, not just focusing on the problem, Uttav directed us to a, to a solution. And the solution was ridiculously simple. Uh, it was a three-layered mud pod that, uh, that was designed by Daily Gump Compost, uh, a Bangalore-based company. And what we did was we tackled the household waste generated, the wet waste generated at the source itself, that is the household. So we... Uh, we uh, brought this product and sold it to the household customers, uh, raised awareness about it, uh, did workshops and campaigns among the target audience, and we and 
helped the households compost the wet waste that was generated at the household itself and use that compost to grow vegetables to grow flowers and to grow greenery around the house itself and that prevented uh i think uh, i forget the number but a uh, huge amount of waste getting gener- getting dumped into the landfill by each household annually yeah and imagine that happens at a city level and the impact of that so yeah so that was a uh, a very enlightening experience and i think that i would say is a was a was my foray into the environmental space the climate space and that was an inspiration for me then after that i have done my uh, i did a i had a short stint with moolya foundation uh, yet another a very impactful organization started by ankit bhatia who is a, a international affairs researcher himself and he started this organization to bring about awareness of the public policy education in india uh, especially among the undergrad uh, and the young you know just getting out of college or getting into the college because uh, and, and and that that's actually a very crucial an impactful year of life a very impressionable time for the youth and so like like you you know that public policy degrees or courses are generally there or were generally there in the advanced stages you know the doctorate or the mphil or post grad stage but i think this uh, with moolya foundation we try to increase the awareness at the undergrad level and uh, you know the uh higher secondary pass out kids if you can call it and and build a sh- start a small course or a summer school with them to just introduce them about the uh, concepts of policy and mm-hmm. how they can make a career out and that that again brings me back to the public policy space in india right. that i was talking yeah. about yeah and uh, one of my reasons to join this space is we are i think at the cusp of you know a boom uh in the in grow given the growth in the indian economy given the position of india in the world order and this would not be a better time to join the policy space and create the impact that i envision because the policy space in india is very nascent and uh, but the organizations are increasingly recognizing the role and use of you know bringing the insights of a trained policy person into their regular day to day affairs it's not just now sidelined to the public affairs or the government relations uh, government affairs division of a corporate or an organization but it the people are brought into normal regular uh, teams to streamline and help in the strategy of the government okay and i think this is a very promising time to be in this okay so what are you are you i have you finished that point or you want to add some more yeah yeah i've finished okay so what is your future what do you want to add so uh, like i said my my area of interest is again the environment space the climate space and sustainable development and uh, so i uh, starting with sequest i think uh, this is this is this is going to be a good start to for my career uh, to begin with and uh, uh, so i want to be in the this space for to create uh, you know a sustainable uh, so my end term goal will be creating a policy for ensuring a sustainable urban growth in the himalayan region okay okay that's what i was trying to ask that that is your idea that we have still lot of uh, ecological things still there the forests are still there and uh, you want to preserve it in a way but still have economic growth yeah okay wonderful anything else you want to add uh yeah i'll just give
right so both this so uh, so i see that uh, uh, you you've been also in the uh, in policy space as consultants and dependent and to the world bank and uh, right now with sequest that i'm working we we focus on the you know the african region to build a government affairs strategy for the african region and one prominent place that you work is tanzania and that's that is the country that i'm working on currently and uh, so uh, so you know uh, what would be your if i could ask about the experience you've had in tanzania the level of social development that they have and and bring a contrast with it with today's tanzania where uh, they are gearing up for the you know to fly to mitigate the climate change impact and the goals they have set for it okay so i'm glad you asked that question uh, you know in general uh african economies are, are quite behind india okay in terms of the human capacity and skill they are quite behind uh india and i think a key problem there is the rapid urbanization you know the capitals are really getting congested and they don't really have a strategy to do much in the rural areas you know this is we i was involved in rural electrification and it's still not it's far from complete even in tanzania it's far from complete people lots of people still don't have electricity so it's no surprise that they want to leave you know because this life is not <clears throat> a modern life of course if they don't have electricity uh, they use uh, let's say car batteries to charge their phones or they go to a shop nearby to charge their phones because today without a smartphone you are lost okay you want to be on with a phone so there is a lot of work to be done if you don't want urban congestion and problems in that part as for climate change i think you know it's a bit too much to press countries like you know you can give them some money but they are so contribute so little to climate change that is hardly a great idea to tell them that listen you can't you have to participate you have to sacrifice if you give them some grants or money then they can do something but to do it without any compensation i think is completely wrong okay and it can't be just loans you know they can't be just made uh indebted because they have to reduce their carbon emissions and so on so i know one of the things that uh, ken newcomb is interested in is uh, getting cooking better better cooking you know the whole world bank also and ken himself and they're looking for carbon selling the carbon emissions now that's a great idea because you are able to improve the lives of the people the health of the women and the children who are otherwise exposed to smoke and to make this change you're going to give them some money that's good but other than that i and also they are not heavy users of coal in tanzania anyway they may be using oil and if they can make use of natural energy you know local energy renewable energy is always local unless you have to buy the panels for solar so solar has the problem of importing panels right you don't import oil but you import the panels right so it's costly to do solar but they have to do it because otherwise there's no way to get lights out to everybody so tanzania is a good country to work in but you have to keep in mind the priorities are first economic growth and especially the rural areas have to come up otherwise the uh, you know dar es salaam i think the capital now is dodoma i haven't been to dodoma but you know it will be very tough to stop the congestion in the cities that's what i can say maybe it doesn't exactly answer your question but i haven't been there since 2014 so you know i'm out of date 
Okay. No, thanks. Thanks for that. It was really insightful. And uh, uh, that's, that's actually a very uh, experienced and uh, balanced view that you give. And that again brings us to the, you know, the equity, how equitable is the climate justice that the developing countries uh, are pressurized to give out their climate mitigation net zero targets. And, and uh, whereas there, you know, the per capita emission that they have is so and uh, yeah, that that's a. Uh, but they are not going to uh, do it. They may set the target, but they are not going to do it. You know, because anyway, it doesn't matter because their contribution is per capita contribution is very small, and if you add up all of sub-Saharan Africa, it doesn't add up. You, you know, the separate countries that they really are not the main. They were not contributors at all in the past. And they're very small contributors now. And to expect them to play a big role, that is just not feasible. It's not doable. Apart from being unethical, they won't do it. So as simple as that, they won't do it. But if you are able to offer them a package that is economic development and mitigation, right? And perhaps adaptation, you know, because some climate change is going to affect them. So you need all three, growth, uh, mitigation, and adaptation. And then that package with some subsidies is doable. I think uh, they have to adapt also because climate change is going to happen, right? And if they are going to suffer from it, then they need adaptation. Plus, they can do some mitigation and they need to have growth. There's just no question about it. Okay. Anything yeah, else you that, want that, to? That, yeah, that uh, I had I had this you know point uh, since a few days in my mind, and I've been thinking about that how economics as a discipline. So I've I've not formally studied economics in my undergrad, but just been exposed to a lot of its role in the policy making and the way it influences policy making. And that's uh, has that's been inspirational for me. That's been, you know, that has inspired me a lot on how economists uh, play such an important role. Uh, and so what are the, you know, the factors that differentiate an economist and that brings them priority anywhere uh, on setting an economic policy or the nation's policy as a whole from, you know, the regular uh, professions like a political scientist or a, a pure scientist or technocrat, a technological scientist. So what is that, uh, you know, uh, that thing of this stream of discipline that makes it so unique? Well, first of all, let me say that economists often make mistakes. <laughs> so, oh, right. so it's not something that we are 100% confident or 100% right. So basically, I think what is our key strength is that we have a good understanding of actually the response of people and companies, firms, small, medium, large, to economic changes. So if there are changes in uh, any economic variable, we have a good feel for how people are going to respond to that. And that is sometimes not so obvious as to how people are going to respond to it okay that includes how will people respond to subsidies right because subsidy is a form of a price change how will people respond to subsidies how will people respond to taxes how will people respond to income changes so all these are pretty clear to economists but in my work, what I found was that my colleagues often would say, no, it can't be. And I would say, no, it is. 
And then I'd ask them, did you never take a course in economics? They said, yeah, we did, but we didn't understand it. <laughs> or we had no interest in it. So this is a, a key aspect of economics that, you know, people, economists do understand. You know, people, for example, many, many decades ago, people used to think that what a family does is purely social and emotional. Right? Purely social, purely emotional factors. And then uh, Professor Gary Becker, who got a Nobel Prize, said that, no, a family is just a production unit. It's a joint production and consumption unit. And uh, even the family responds to economic incentives. Right? If you gave... Uh, so, for example, if your income rises then you don't want to spend your time cooking basics. You might want to actually eat out or have it delivered or hire somebody to do the cooking for you so that you can have the time. <clears throat> and he accurately predicted that if the wage situation changes, then many women will actually give up household duties and go to work and earn the money. So it's not just social, it's just not political and cultural, which it is, but there's also a lot of economic thinking behind it. So I think that's the main thing uh, that uh, people bring. And that's at least what I used to contribute uh, to the projects, how to do. Uh, of course, there's, there's a technical aspect to it. And then there's a social aspect to it. And there's a political aspect to it. But there's also an economic aspect. And so we need to not ignore it. We need to have it center because you are going to provide subsidies. You are going to help people. Then it's a subsidy. So you have to understand. For example, right now, they're given this scheme of uh, free bus service for women in Karnataka. Okay. And then you have to know, you have to be able to predict and that, you know, how many will actually take advantage of it, right? Because then you need to budget the amount in the expenditure. Will the buses get overcrowded or will they not get overcrowded? If they get overcrowded, you have to run many more buses. This So anyway, I'm saying that the economic uh, and in macro, it's completely different. This is at the micro level. But uh, macroeconomics, you know, what's the exchange rate policy? What is the impact of exchange rate? What is the impact of interest rates? All those things are not available in any other subject. So I think that's in short what I would say. Right. Thanks, thanks, Professor. That was, that was interesting. That is insightful. Okay, so shall we end it here or you have another question? Uh so no, that's that's all from my side. Uh, okay. I just I'm grateful for the opportunity that you're providing, especially the young boys through India to this yeah. platform. And uh, but again, uh, I know this platform is want us to speak more than yourself. But yeah. I wouldn't want to leave you without the two cents of advice that you'd give to me personally, uh, for a person starting career in the policy space, and through me, so many people who are aspiring to. Well, I tell you that uh, I don't really like to give advice to young people in India because I'm so out of touch with the opportunities. But what I can say is that India today has many opportunities. That's what I can say. And there are, I have interviewed so many different people who are doing things in so many different ways. That is just amazing. And they're all interested in making the country develop. And uh, at some point, we need to have a way of making them communicate with each other. Okay, This is, I find, sorely missing. That, you know, I interviewed a young woman yesterday. She is trying to understand the social impact of policies. 
She's saying that policies are designed without understanding the social impact because I'm in the impact evaluation and I've gone to this place and that place and this policies aren't working. Policies aren't working and there's no impact therefore. And I think that it's not that I'm saying impact is important. I'm saying that the young people are actually quite good, innovative, and motivated. But they're not connected with each other. You know, you work for one organization, you work for another organization, you do an internship here, but you're not connected with like-minded people, okay? And that is sorely missing, I think. And I'd love for this channel to become a means of communication, though I don't know how to do it. But in the future, as I have enough people coming here and talking, one of my purposes is that this should become a channel for people to actually be in touch with each other. You know, not just be by yourself and seniors because you are junior in a company and you're working there. But how about the so many other young people who are looking to do something and to have, so that's what I would say, uh, that it's missing. And actually my aim is even broader. My aim is that it should become what I call as a Desi channel. <laughs> They see means all our neighboring countries. <laughs> I don't want to call it South Asia because South Asia is bloody geography <laughs> and subcontinental see, is even worse. <laughs> so they see, they, they see the word hits and brings out the message. Yeah, so they see. I want this to be a Desi channel, and I have two people from Bangladesh, uh, one from Nepal coming up, one from Pakistan coming up, and maybe one from Bhutan. And I'm hoping to get people from Sri Lanka so that we actually chart our own, the young people, they chart their own networks and they make their own way forward, you know, without relying on the older people who are still discussing whether social media is good or bad. I say, what? <laughs> this, is, this is obsolete, obsolete. But my peers, they think it's social media good, it's social media bad. I say, what are you guys talking about? So I want to create this part of it is that I want this channel to link young people to, and, but they have to take the initiative. Okay, I have provided a channel and a platform and I'm available, but uh, it has to be, for, are there are some economists who have formed a group called Reimagining Economics. Okay, the, the young people starting from small town in Kerala, they have formed a group called Reimagining Economics and KN Raj Club, KN Raj, very famous economist. But it should not be just economists. It should be people from all disciplines and they can form a like-minded group. And this channel may be a way to get started, but ultimately we need those links so that we learn from not just the experience of seniors, but also from the motivation and thinking of young people who are more on the ground than the seniors. Like this woman who was telling me, uh, Niyanta Desai, just yesterday that, oh, I went to a remote part of Nagaland. Now, you know how many people in Delhi have been to a remote part of Nagaland? Probably none. But she has been, she knows, right? She knows what's happening there. And she's been to rural parts of Maharashtra also. So, you know, there's knowledge. But it is not combined. And what are the lessons from it? And she asked me, what should I do next? I said, you should stop thinking only about how to evaluate it, but how to put it into the design of the project so that we collect the data on the variables that measure social impact, not just on output. For example, we don't just count how many people got LPG stove, okay? But 
we also look to see what is the impact of it on the people. And that kind of impact variable we should put right into the design of the project. Right? That in public policy. So that's one point I want to emphasize that public policy should be about impact and change. In fact, now that you are talking about it, you know, I wrote a book called Core Economics two years back, and I'm now adding five chapters to it uh, on public policy. It's not, I've only written one chapter. I'm so busy with these videos that I haven't done it. But it, and one of the themes in that uh, book in the first chapter is that really we are not looking only at public policy is an instrument for public change. And we should not focus only on public policy. We should focus on public change. How does change come about? And you know, the whole, not whole, a lot of the discussion in public policy is how to do policy. But that's missing the point. And she made it to me very clearly that, look, where is the impact? I don't see it. I go out there and there's no impact of the policy. So impact to me means change. You know, So you need to focus on public change. And that's one of the key themes in chapter one. And let me know. I mean, I don't write things in the normal way with outline. I just write, okay. <laughs> so then I don't know exactly what I'm going to write, but something I'll write. But it should be, well, one of these days it will be ready. And I hope that will help some people think about public change, oh. not just. So this, this is kind of what I would like to say to you, that focus on public change not on public policy. Public policy is one way of bringing uh, public change. Like, you know, you can't really put a public policy on say, you know, we have tried public policy on dowry, okay, in India, okay. But dowry is still there. You can make it a law that it's illegal, but dowry is going on every day, right? It's not something that is not going on. It's going on, right? But so you have to understand that this public policy done in the way public policies are done are not bringing about public change. So it is not necessarily public policy by the executive branch approved by the legislative branch. And then there are many policies that are brought about by the courts. Right? Like the courts uh, simply uh, in India, the Supreme Court uh, declared gay sex as no longer illegal. Okay, so that's a big public change, but it's not done through the government or through parliament. Anyway, let me stop talking. I talk too much. <laughs> okay. It's now not my place to talk here. It's your place. So let me stop and let's see if you have any questions or otherwise we end it here. Yeah, absolutely, I think. Uh, that was an insightful comment and insightful uh, advice to me and us, I could say, as a whole. And definitely looking forward to reading your book. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Let's say bye. Bye, everybody. I'll be back with another young, enthusiastic Indian or outsider or an expert. Till then, bye. <laughs>